the events that took place in this room 10 years ago would not have seemed in any way spectacular to a casual observer. He would have seen a large uh, black graphite structure of which uh, there is uh, a scale model supported in part by a scaffolding of wooden beams. He would have seen a number of people reading instruments and uh, recording their results. Perhaps he might not even have noticed many signs of excitement in their faces because the experiment in which the first uh, self-sustaining chain reaction was obtained had been preceded by a great number of other... It is December 2nd, 1952. Which had made the, the voice is that of Enrico Fermi, the speaking before a gathering that is commemorating the 10th anniversary the of the first controlled nuclear chain reaction. Actually, the experiment we are in the very same rackets court under the west stands of Stag Field. It was here that Fermi and his colleagues ushered in the nuclear age. The war lasted almost three more years after December 2nd, 1942, and throughout this period, the task of producing an effective atomic bomb was the one on which the scientists concentrated. In less than two years, November 29th, 1954, Enrico Fermi would be dead of stomach cancer at the age of 53. The Italian navigator's scientific voyage came to an end while he was still at the height of his mental powers. The world of physics had lost a giant, a man of extraordinary intelligence and mental brilliance. The only physicist of the 20th century to excel in both theory and experiment. The most durable monument to Fermi has been his own work, the author of many scientific papers, winner of the Nobel Prize in Physics, a guiding genius of the Manhattan Project. His honors have been numerous, his legacy profound. But somewhere in the flourish of all his scientific endeavor is the untold story of Enrico Fermi, the story of his humility, his uncanny physical intuition, his clear thinking, his unpretentious nature. Much of this story is voiced by the many people who knew and worked with Fermi during his lifetime. Men like John Wheeler of Princeton University. The idea of Fermi was somehow always to get on top of the scene, on top of the picture. I can remember the climbs in days in the state of Washington out in the countryside on a Sunday. And Fermi was always pushing ahead to get to the top first. And, and on another occasion, an irrigation canal that we were swimming in and the fast stream of water down this concrete ditch with the steep sloping sides we had a bar across downstream so that if any of us was carried too far he could grab hold and save himself and we then raised the question with each other there were about eight of us out on this picnic what would we do if we lost the bar and couldn't get hold could we save ourselves and fermi resolved to prove that he could so here he was being carried downstream by the water and all the time fighting to cr climb up the steep side of this concrete wall. And at last he did make it with his uh, shins bleeding and his fingers a bit torn, but he made it. And I never saw a better illustration of his drive to make any idea that he had go through. Why Fermi? What in his nature contributed so widely to the admiration and respect he received from people in all walks of life. There was Gus Newth, a carpenter who worked on the Manhattan Project. Fermi, that man, he, I liked him and he liked me. Let me tell you, we just got along like that. There was Otto Hillig, an immigrant machinist from Denmark who worked with Fermi. Fermi, he was a wonderful guy. Uh, he used to say one thing he told me, he built everything up himself, and he stick it together with Scott's tape. He told me once, what can science do without Scott's tape? From the testimony of technicians to the board chairman of the DuPont Company, Crawford Greenewald. Uh, the person that really impresses me most among all the people that I met there was Fermi himself. It seemed to me he was really an extraordinary man. Uh, 
I happen to believe that what you do in life uh, is as much a matter of chance as it is of any direction on your part. And that great ability uh, can manifest itself in many different ways. Fermi, I think, was an ideal case. He happened to be a physicist, but I think he could have gone into any profession, whether by accident or by design, and done extraordinarily well at it. He was really a very able man, a brilliant man, and a very cultured man. And I think there's not very little doubt about it that uh, on the physics side of it, on the uh, experimental work aimed at determining whether a chain reaction would go or not, Fermi was the key individual. Fermi combined a supreme ability as a theoretical and experimental physicist. George Weil remembers. Fermi was an all-around scientist. He was not only a great theoretical physicist, he contributed to practically every field in physics. He was a great experimental physicist, and he could brush aside details that other people would just get uh, bogged down in. One scientist who knew him longest and worked with him intimately day after day was Herb Anderson. Well, of course, it was a very important uh, part of my life. It represented, well, from 1939 to 1954, 15 years of almost daily contact with an extremely brilliant man and uh, had a very great influence on my life. Well, we got a lot of things done together, and much more than I've been able to accomplish since. <laughs> I haven't been able to be nearly as effective after the death of Fermi as, uh, as I was when he was alive. Enrico Fermi was born in Rome, Italy, on September 29, 1901. The house was near the railroad station at the Via Gaeta No. 19. He was the third and last child born to Alberto and Ida Fermi. There was Marie, his older sister, and Giulio, his older brother. Enrico's father was employed in the administration of the Italian railroads. His mother was an elementary school teacher. Only three years separated the three children, and Mrs. Fermi was unable to attend to young Enrico. For the first two and a half years of his life, he lived with nurses in the Italian countryside, a common practice at the time. As a young boy, Enrico displayed an all-consuming curiosity about the world around him. This innate curiosity fired his ambition. He was a model student, consistently achieving good marks. He had a prodigious memory for poems, Still, he once confessed that when he was 10, he had to struggle to understand why a circle was represented by the equation x squared plus y squared equals r squared. But it was mathematics that first claimed his attention at age 13. His genius was recognized first by Adolfo Amadei, an engineer who was a friend of the Fermi family. He encouraged Enrico lent him books on science, and guided his math and physics studies between the ages of 13 and 17. In 1915, tragedy struck. Enrico's older brother, Giulio, died of a throat abscess before anesthesia could be administered for surgery. He was only 15. Giulio's sudden death left a deep mark on young Enrico, whose introverted and mute sorrow never really conveyed his true feeling of loss. To fill the void, young Fermi struck up a childhood relationship with Enrico Persico. The two boys had mutual scientific interests. They whiled away their idle time at the Campo dei Fiori, an outdoor flea market comparable to Chicago's Maxwell Street. Swept up in their scientific curiosity, the two youngsters determined the density of Rome tap water, as well as the Earth's magnetic field. It was a rewarding, lasting friendship. At the age of 17, under the urging of Amadei, Enrico entered competition for a scholarship to the Reale Scuola Normale Superiore in Pisa. He wrote an essay entitled, Distinctive Character of Sound. When picked as the winner of the competition, 
It meant four years of education with no cost to the Fermi family. It was November 1918. The school established in 1810 by Napoleon was in Pisa, birthplace and home of the great Italian astronomer Galileo. Here Fermi struck up a friendship with Franco Rossetti. The two young physics students made long Sunday excursions on the Alpio Pone in the Apennines, north of Pisa. It was a relationship that would last their entire lifetime. Enrico received his PhD in physics from the University of Pisa in 1922, graduating magna cum laude. When he returned to Rome, Enrico went to talk with Orso Mario Corbino, director of the physics laboratory at the University of Rome. Their meeting reflected a mutual desire to develop a revival of Italian physics. For seven months in 1923, Fermi studied in Göttingen, Germany, on a fellowship from the Italian Ministry of Public Industry. He worked with the great German physicist Max Born. The experience never proved satisfying to Fermi. Later, he returned to Rome to teach an elementary course in mathematics for chemists and science students. About this time, another countryman, Emilio Segre, came into the picture. Segre was the son of a paper mill owner near Rome and was an engineering student when he first heard of Fermi. I had heard Fermi talk, uh, say around 1923 or 24, when he was not yet in Rome. Uh, he was known among a small circle. I mean, it was known that there was an extraordinary man. Uh, he had just gotten his PhD, and he was invited to give some talk in a seminar of mathematicians. I was a student of engineering. I was interested in physics and so on, uh, so I went to hear him. But I didn't talk to him. I just uh, heard him first. It was 1924. The Fermi family was again shaken by tragedy when Mrs. Fermi died on May 8th. She had never really recovered from the sudden death of Giulio nine years before. While still in mourning for his mother, young Fermi happened to make the casual acquaintance of a 16-year-old girl, Laura Capone. He and other friends spent that Sunday afternoon playing soccer along the banks of the Tiber River. It was a very casual meeting for the 22-year-old Fermi, one that would lead to more deliberate meetings at street corners. Laura Capone was the daughter of a highly cultured and respected Jewish family in Rome. Her father was an admiral in the Italian Navy. In typical scientific fashion, Fermi was soon off again. This time, under the urging of Dutch physicist George Uhlenbeck, Fermi went to the University of Leiden. He had won a fellowship from the International Education Board to study under the great teacher Paul Ehrenfest. For three months, in the fall of 1924, Fermi worked side by side with Ehrenfest. It was an example of the international character of European science and led to Fermi's many summer trips to America in the early 1930s. He finished his study at Leiden and returned to Florence. Emilio Segre recalls the atmosphere. Fermi was in Florence for uh, about uh, two years as a professor, as uh, what you would say a non-tenured professor. He won a competition and came to Rome in 1927. Uh, he brought in to Rome uh, Rossetti, who was his schoolmate and friend and so on. Fermi tried uh, to form, uh, to, to find some other people, to form a school, to uh, get some other uh, persons for the uh, physics laboratory and so on. And uh, at that time, I met first Rasetti, and then immediately thereafter, through Rasetti, uh, Fermi. The 26-year-old Fermi was appointed professor of theoretical physics at the University of Rome by Professor Corbino. His arrival signaled the beginning of the golden age of physics at the university. The 21-year-old Segre sensed the excitement. It was clear that Fermi was going to bring a revival, and uh, so I transferred from engineering to physics. 
and I joined the physics department in the fall of 27 with the new scholastic year. See, by the beginning of 27, there was Rasetti, who was already an assistant professor. There was myself as a student, Amaldi, and uh, Majorana. And then later, other people came. Uh, this was the first nucleus of a very active group, which stuck together, the, together for many years. See, there was not much difference of age. And uh, we became very good friends. Seven years separated the oldest from the youngest in the group, which came to be called Corbino's Boys. It was a time of great scientific activity in the physics building on the Via Panisperna. The hours were from 9 till 12.30 and from 3 till 7 p.m. In the center of this revival was Fermi, whose profound insight and simplicity of approach marked him as a great teacher. It was Segre who named him the Pope. Uh, Fermi taught us uh, physics, essentially by private instruction. And this one went on for uh, two or three years. We were very well set with, for theory, because, I mean, Fermi was uh, as good a theoretician as any, and we had no problems in being completely up-to-date in theory. But in experiment, it was another story. It was much more uh, complicated. Fermi's first major contribution to physics came in 1926, when he discovered the statistics valid for particles obeying Pauli's exclusion principle. They are now universally known as Fermi-Dirac statistics. He also contributed an important work on nuclear spectroscopy. In 1927, one day less than three years after his mother's death, Fermi's father died. In a span of 13 short years, three members of the Fermi family had passed away. A year later, on July 19, 1928, at the age of 26, Enrico Fermi married Laura Capon, now 21. It was a hot day, 104 degrees in the shade. Enrico was late for the ceremony because of a need to shorten the sleeves of his wedding shirt. The honeymoon began from the Fiumicino airport west of Rome. The young couple crowded into a two-engine seaplane and flew along the Tyrrhenian Sea to Genoa. The last advice of the bride's mother to a 21-year-old daughter was, see that your husband stops wearing hazelnut suits. They don't become him. Research and experiment continued at a steady pace at the University of Rome. Fermi and his colleagues contributed to an understanding of gas theory. How electrons and metal conduct electricity. Why electrons do not contribute to the specific heat of substance. In 1929, Fermi was one of the first 30 members named to the Royal Academy of Italy. The only physicist named to the group. Fermi, who hated to be conspicuous, showed great displeasure every time he had to wear the peacock uniform of the Royal Academy. In the summer of 1930, Enrico and his wife spent two months in the United States. He was lecturing on quantum theory of radiation at the University of Michigan. During these annual conferences on theoretical physics, Fermi compared ideas with some of the great minds of the scientific world. He returned to the United States for four more summers. In 1933, 35, 36, and 37. Laura Fermi expresses some of Enrico's reasons for coming to these conferences. Enrico had thought he'd like America, and he'd come in the summer, they'd make him an offer for later on and he'd accept it and then he'd start working in Italy with his people and his group and so at the moment of leaving there was something going on he couldn't leave his you know let down the younger people and well I had been here only once because I'd stay in Italy and Rico would come in summers. Six months after her return from America Mrs. Fermi gave birth to her first child, Nella. In 
on January 31st, 1931. Five years later, she blessed Enrico with Giulio, a son named after Fermi's deceased brother. In late 1933, Fermi demonstrated the reach of his great analytical mind. He developed the theory of beta decay emission based on Pauli's idea of the neutrino. Emilio Segre underscores the paper's importance. This was a, a very, very important uh, paper which he wrote in the last months of uh, 33. And Fermi put this on a quantitative basis. He made a real theory which would predict things on the basis of uh, Pauli hypothesis and uh, was one of his major uh, contribution to uh, theory and to nuclear physics. I mean, this paper on the beta decay is really one of the major discoveries. 1934 was the year Fermi and his colleagues performed the bombardment experiments that led to his Nobel Prize. It was also the true beginning of Fermi's long road to the development of the first nuclear chain reaction. Corbino's boys had stumbled upon experimental evidence of the effect of slow neutrons. Emilio Segre recalls the moment. When uh, Fermi, in 1934, read of the discovery of artificial radioactivity by Curie and Joliot, he immediately recognized that replacing the projectiles, uh, alpha particles, with neutrons, one would create the possibility of making many more radioactive isotopes. And with characteristic vigor, uh, Fermi grabbed this opportunity, recognizing the magnitude of the enterprise, he asked uh, his former pupils, Amaldi, Rasetti, myself, and uh, to help in the work. And later we were joined by D'Agostino and still later by Ponte Corvo. The Italian group had bombarded uranium with neutrons and produced several radioactive substances one of which they could not identify. Perhaps it was a new element. The new substance did not fit into the periodic table near uranium. It was a science puzzle that would last for four more years. Much later, Fermi related that they were not imaginative enough to think of uranium's unique disintegration process. He also felt that not enough was known of separation chemistry at the time. The new element in reality proved to be a mixture of disintegration products that belonged back in the middle of the periodic table. The middle 30s in Central Europe may have been an active time of scientific research, but it also was a time that ushered in the dark forces of tyranny that were fast sweeping through Europe. Emilio Segre and Mrs. Fermi recall the period. Up to 1938, it looked as if the Italians were on top, and then from the beginning of 1938, it was the Germans who were on top, and there was no doubt of that. And from then on, it looked bad. There was uh, Hitler always grabbing more territory and uh, becoming a bigger and bigger menace. Early summer of 1938, Italy joined Germany, but Italy went, became more and more a vassal state of Germany. They started the anti-Semitic uh, legislation, that started uh, to follow uh, Hitler. This uh, made an intolerable situation because, uh, well, Fermi personally was not affected, but his wife is Jewish. The children couldn't go to school, or maybe they could have gone to school, but with uh, uh, some uh, handicap, I don't know. I mean, so. He decided that uh, there was nothing he could do anymore and he had to quit. And then in the summer of 38, Italy started to promulgate racial legislation. And I'm Jewish. And although that didn't make too much difference, especially in Italy, we could have stayed and so on. But it was some kind of the last try. And uh, so we decided to leave at about that time. It was a major emotional decision for Mrs. Fermi 
causing her great pain. She had been born in Rome, always lived there. Her relatives and friends were there. She felt she belonged to Rome. But in May of 1938, Hitler visited Italy as a guest of Mussolini, and the die was cast. Once the racial and other restrictive laws were passed in early September, the Italians emigrating to the United States increased rapidly. It was time to make plans. Fermi had already received five offers to come to America. Mrs. Fermi remembers. We planned several times to come. As a matter of fact, at the um, Institute for Advanced Studies, there was for a long time a physicist who was called Fermi's assistant. And of course, we never were there, and Enrico was never there, but he had accepted the position on condition that he would have an assistant. So the assistant was there. <laughs> The collaboration of Italian physics was fast coming to an end. The Corbino group was being dissolved by uncontrollable forces. Professor Corbino had died of pneumonia in January 1937 at the age of 67. Segre in Palermo since 1936 remained permanently at the University of California following a summer session there. Rossetti would leave Italy in June of 1939 to become professor of physics at Laval University in Quebec. And now Fermi was planning to leave in early 1939. Only Amalli would remain in Rome. In the early morning hours of November 10th, 1938, Mrs. Fermi received a call informing her that Professor Fermi would receive a telephone call from Stockholm at six that evening. It was the Nobel Prize. The four years of patient research, the broken and unbroken tubes of brilliant powder and radon, the races down the hall of the physics building, the many tests, the paraffin blocks, all had finally culminated in the Nobel Prize. The secretary of the Swedish Academy of Sciences read the citation over the phone. To Professor Enrico Fermi of Rome for his identification of new radioactive elements made in connection with his work of nuclear reactions affected by slow neutrons. The Fermis immediately altered their plans to leave Italy sooner. Emilio Segre recalls the incident. When he received the Nobel Prize, he decided to quit in the summer. And he passed word to uh, American friends that uh, circumstances had changed and that uh, he would be receptive to an offer in America. Then he got the Nobel Prize, and he was notified confidentially that he was going to get the Nobel Prize. And uh, so that when he knew this, he made his preparation and went to uh, Sweden, and then from Sweden, went directly to Colombia. Fermi, his wife, two children and a maid, boarded a train on December 6, 1938, bound for Stockholm. He left his laboratory, his equipment, his colleagues. Enrico told Italian officials he was making a six-month visit to New York. Sixteen days later, on December 10, 1938, Enrico Fermi, an American novelist, Pearl Buck, sat in center stage of the concert hall. They were presented their Nobel Prizes by King Gustavus V of Sweden. The Fermis left Southampton aboard the Italian liner Franconi on Christmas Eve, 1938. The crossing would take nine days. He would soon be free of fascist interference to continue his work. It was midwinter when they arrived in New York. Mrs. Fermi remembers. We arrived the 2nd of January, 1939. It was our first cold, cold winter, really cold winter. We lived on 116th Street in, uh, on Riverside Drive, and there is some kind of a funnel-like entrance to 116th from Riverside Drive. And I remember my son, who was crying on the street because of the wind and the cold. During the month that the Fermi family was en route to America, 
A flurry of excitement was gripping the scientific world. The strange, unexplained disintegration substances that Fermi's group had created in the laboratory in 1934 were byproducts of a new process called fission. Importance of this discovery was carried to America by the great Danish physicist Niels Bohr. He arrived in New York on Sunday, January 16, 1939, at the West 57th Street Pier, aboard the Swedish liner Drottingholm. With him was the news that Otto Hahn and Fritz Strassmann had discovered the fission of uranium at the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute of Berlin, and Lisa Meitner had explained it. Mrs. Fermi remembers. Perhaps more important, I remember when Bohr arrived two, just two weeks after we did, and we had been almost the Bohr's guests in Copenhagen uh, when we went through to come to the United States. So we went to meet him. And from then on, th things started to happen. I remember he, he was always talking about war, the possibilities of war, and he was very pessimistic. Also on the dock in New York, when the Drottingholm dropped anchor, was a former student of Niels Bohr, John Wheeler. The day that uh, I met Bohr was the beginning of work on fission, and he soon had to go back to Denmark. But uh, we had great discussions at that time, uh, Wigner, Fermi, Szilard, and other colleagues, about what would be the future of fission. And I can remember Bohr saying that it would be impossible to think of making a weapon, that it would take the efforts of an entire country to do it. And little did he realize that there would be the efforts of three countries involved, England, Canada, and the United States. The epidemic speed by which things happened was phenomenal. The world of physics was aflame with news of fission. Herb Anderson, then a graduate student at Columbia University, gives personal testimony to Bohr's own excitement. Fermi arrived, and, uh, and then Niels Bohr came with his great news about the, this new process called fission. And when he came to the laboratory, he arrived in New York, and he wanted to talk to Fermi right away. So he came immediately to Columbia and looked for Fermi and didn't find him, but he found me. I was sitting in the lab, uh, and he was so full of uh, his news that he began to explain to me about the fission. Within days of Bohr's arrival, four American laboratories had experimentally confirmed the fission process. Mrs. Fermi recounts the activity. Enrico explained it to me, and shortly after that, they stopped talking about it. So I would say that they announced their thoughts at a meeting that must have taken place around January 30 or something like that, one week or two weeks after Bohr's arrival. Then early spring, they had the secrecy. The letter that Einstein signed, uh, he signed it in August, but I think they started thinking about it quite a bit before. So they went twice to talk to Einstein. The neutrons, which scientists were using to verify the fission process, were old friends to Fermi. After all, he was the greatest living expert on neutrons. They answered many questions that had troubled him back in the physics building in Rome in 1934. Herb Anderson and Mrs. Fermi recall his motivation. Fermi, you see, uh, having uh, uh, had such a great reputation in working with neutrons, would naturally uh, enter into this field as a sort of a natural sequence of events. He would feel that it would be a dereliction not to go into it. In, in a sense, Enrico picked the, the work up when he heard about the discovery of fission because fission explained what he had done in Rome and what they had not understood was going on. But it was all the same chain of things and going on in the same line. The first job? Look for the hypothetical neutrons to find the heavy pulse of ionization from fission. This required an experiment. Although Fermi was a newly appointed professor of physics at Columbia University, he had no experimental apparatus. Herb Anderson remembers. I had uh, constructed an ionization chamber and a linear amplifier, the popular sort of equipment for research in those days. And here was Enrico Fermi, famous nuclear physicist just back from having won the Nobel Prize for his discoveries with slow neutrons, 
And here he was in a new country, in a new university, with no apparatus whatever. Uh, this was a, a, a sorry state for such a great man to be in. And so I said, look, Professor Fermi, I uh, have all this equipment, and there are experiments that ought to be done with, uh, to prove the existence of uh, this fission process, to demonstrate the energy release. Why don't we work together? I need a, a professor who will sponsor my thesis, and, uh, and you don't have all the equipment that I have. <laughs> The same research work was also being tackled by a second group at Columbia, led by Canadian-born Walter Zinn and Hungarian Leo Szilard. The two groups published their results side by side in the physical review. The catalyst in this fever pitch activity was the knowledge that fission had been discovered in Hitler's Germany, which had just gobbled up the rest of Czechoslovakia. There was an implied race to demonstrate a nuclear chain reaction. On March 16, 1939, Dr. George Pegram, chairman of the physics department at Columbia, wrote the Navy Department, Professor Fermi is professor of physics at Columbia University and was awarded the Nobel Prize. There is no man more competent in this field of nuclear physics than Professor Fermi. Later, both Pegram and Fermi went to Washington to apprise the Navy Department of the dangers and prospects of atomic physics. Their evaluation of future results were filled with question marks and skepticism. General Leslie Groves, who later directed the Manhattan Project, remembers. I think Pegram and Fermi came down to talk to the Navy Department about it, and when they were asked about uh, what they thought of it, uh, did they think it would succeed, Fermi said, well, I don't know whether it'll work or not. Well, that's no way to get support from anybody that you want to get money from. It took the August 2nd, 1939 letter by Albert Einstein to President Roosevelt to convince the American government. A few weeks later, on September 1st, 1939, Hitler invaded Poland. Much of the impetus for alerting the president came from foreign-born scientists, aliens who had first-hand experience with fascist methods. Although an advisory committee on uranium was formed, the research moved no faster than its natural pace. Soon the first lattice structure of graphite and uranium was set up at Columbia. Fermi and Zinn's groups were looking for a material to slow down the neutrons. The only material pure enough and somewhat available was graphite. Good for making pencils, good for making arc lamps, good for oiling locks. The work on the exponential piles began with lattices of uranium and dirty, slippery carbon. Moller Zinn and Herb Anderson recalls Fermi's trait of pitching in, no matter what the work. The work was hot, dirty, and heavy. Fortunately, Fermi was able to recruit a fraction of the Columbia football squad to assist in this effort. Since in those days, football players were expected to earn some of their support by doing use <laughs> by doing useful work for the university. It was characteristic of Fermi that he participated in, the, in this work on an equal basis with the athletic brawn. I could not say the same was true for the rest of us. It didn't make any difference whether it was mental work or physical work or just the worst kind of tedium. He always felt that he should do more than anybody else, any other single person. Fermi always displayed unbounded energy and physical stamina. At the laboratory, he was the first to arrive, the last to leave. His basic philosophy was honesty comes before modesty. He was more prone to deeds than to talk. His most disarming trait, a lack of formality. Dr. Harry DeWolf Smythe, author of the Smythe Report, recalls an example. Professor Fermi was uh, doing some work on our cyclotron at Princeton. The cyclotron there was down in a deep pit in the basement. Not a particularly attractive place to work, but we didn't worry much about that in those days. Uh, I went in one day to make sure that everything was all right. After all, Fermi was a guest. He was coming down from Columbia just for a few experiments. And from where I came in, I could look down to this pit. And what I saw was 
Professor Fermi and one graduate student moving a table under the direction of another graduate student. And I thought that was the kind of cooperation that was good. It was a characteristic Fermi exemplified throughout his life. Later in Chicago, George Weil crystallizes the trait perfectly. And I recall when uh, representatives of DuPont uh, came to visit Fermi when they had, uh, they looked in his office and he wasn't there, and they looked uh, in the laboratory and he wasn't there, and they finally located him uh, on the floor in a, a big lab coat with a great big shears cutting up some tin. This sort of shocked them that a Nobel Prize winner wouldn't be uh, sitting behind a plush desk with uh, directing things, you know, but Fermi wasn't that kind of a person. He made the measurements, he dashed down the halls, we had a limited time in which to make the measurements, he did everything. And uh, his facility in, uh, in interpreting the me measurements was just unique. Nobody had that facility. It was now December 6th, 1941. To speed up the atomic research, Vannevar Bush, director of the Office of Scientific Research and Development, reorganized the project. Arthur Holly Compton of the University of Chicago was put in charge of the uranium work. All effort became concentrated in Chicago. Groups from Princeton and Columbia transferred to Chicago, and a metallurgical laboratory was established. The next day, Pearl Harbor, and the lid of secrecy closed down on the project. Mrs. Fermi remembers. They imposed secrecy on themselves, and then I didn't hear anything for years until the Smythe report was ready. Then one day we were still in Los Alamos, so it must have been 1945 still. Enrico came with a mimeographed copy of the Smythe report and said, maybe you are being interested in, in reading this. And he didn't volunteer any help. So <laughs> It was pretty hard going, but then I understood what had gone on, why the secrecy, the pile. We didn't know anything about the pile. And Ten years after the secrecy, Enrico Fermi himself dispelled some of the misconceptions about who imposed the secrecy. Secrecy in science did not exist to any appreciable extent before the war. The military importance of science appears to have brought the necessity of at least some amount of secrecy. In this respect, perhaps, many people believe that keeping uh, secret results in the field of atomic fission uh, that could lead to the development of the atomic bomb was imposed on the scientists by the military authorities. The truth is quite different, and the first agreements to keep certain results confidential were entered into freely among scientists in this country long before the government or the armed services manifested any interest in the matter. In the spring of 1942, Fermi moved to Chicago. The work on subcritical sized piles was continued. The objective? Create a chain reaction at the earliest possible date. Fermi, Szilard, and Wigner had already worked out the theory. These exponential piles required only about one twentieth the materials of a chain reacting pile. Walter Zinn underscores their importance. By the way, this exponential experiment, which was a very powerful tool, was the invention of, of Fermi and, and was uh, used in a wonderful manner by, by his uh, very powerful analytical techniques. Many experiments and calculations were performed. There were 30 experimental subcritical piles constructed and tested before the final pile was begun. Herb Anderson remembers. I think the, the uh, interesting fact about it is that it was a, a major enterprise. It could be carried out very effectively by a small group of physicists alone without any engineers and without any, without any design, without any formal planning of any sort other than what went, went on in our own heads. The design of this thing uh, was made from day to day and was adjusted uh, according to the material that was coming in. Everybody from technicians to top administration gained immense confidence in Fermi's ability and scientific judgment. Building and testing these exponential piles was almost second nature to Fermi. <laughs> 
After all, he had been building piles since the first weeks in 1939. George Weil recalls a typical episode. And I, I recall one incident where one of our group was supposed to be doing calculations, broke his leg on a skiing trip, and uh, so he wasn't able to do much work, so Fermi gave him an assignment uh, to calculate theoretically what was going on in these uh, exponential piles, and he must have spent uh, at least two or three weeks on this calculation. And I was there one Saturday afternoon uh, making measurements, and Fermi came in, and he sat down and said, well, I think I'll just check uh, you know, what so-and-so did, and in uh, half an hour, he had gone through the whole thing. Theoretical physics or mathematics, what you want to call it, was like a language to him. He could see the, uh, the peaks and uh, forget about the hills. A very intuitive man. Spring turned to summer. With each exponential pile, more data, more confidence. The scene under the west stands of Stag Field was like a coal mine. Men drilling graphite bricks, cutting them, carrying them, stacking them. Others making measurements, others checking the critical size of the piles. The physicist worked 24 hours a day in two shifts. Walter Zinn recalls the routine. This was now the third year, not only working full time, I mean working every moment that one could get on it, to finally see the chain reaction which we recognized, uh, no question at all, of, uh, of, of supreme importance in, in uh, both science and in, uh, in the application of science. The full responsibility of the project was now under the newly formed Manhattan Engineer District. The methodical step-by-step -step approach to achieving a chain reaction was all Fermi's idea. He was the guiding genius, the infallible oracle, completely self-confident, wholly without conceit. Herb Anderson and John Wheeler endorsed his methods. And even though it looked like an indirect method to make a slow chain reaction in order to get uh, an atomic bomb, uh, he, he felt instinctively that uh, we would learn so much about the principles and basic scientific facts that what we would learn would clear the way to what we were looking for in the end uh, much more quickly than anybody else. Of course, uh, that was something that Fermi insisted on very strongly, that this reactor and having the reactor succeed was uh, the first step before you could ever think of building a bomb. Although in practice, if you had had uranium-235, you could have put it together to make a bomb quite without building one of these piles. But Fermi insisted on this necessity of proving the principle and understanding it. So what Fermi was trying to do was to impress them on what a marvelous thing this was. And uh, even though he'd never tried it before, he prepared himself very carefully and he had calculated uh, what the reaction would be as he took each step. The original plan, build the final critical pile at the Argonne site, a new building far from the urban complex west of Chicago. It was scheduled to be finished by October 20th. Labor strikes and construction difficulties delayed its completion. A decision had to be made. Some administrators wanted to wait. Wait until Argonne was ready. Fermi himself was impatient. Herb Anderson explains. Fermi, who never liked the idea of all this formality anyway, that would only hold things up, said, look, I mean, I can build the whole thing in the West Stands. It'll take six weeks. Uh, uh, why don't you let me do it? 